Hi, it's Ken Sex here with the last series in the long running series of building Linux from scratch 1.0 to the latest version, which is 12.1. So, as the previous video, I built Linux from scratch, or previous series of videos, I built Linux from scratch 8.2, which itself was based on cross Linux from scratch 3.0.0. .0 .0. And that was fairly routine. I found in the end it was um, a successful build. I was slightly concerned because of some issues with the final installation of CLFS, which um, I've had some issues with before building CLFS. Um, but as it was, the build went pretty well. Um, and because of that, and also because with this um, long series, I've not only done um, Linux from scratch, I've done bits from beyond Linux from scratch, as well as obviously I've just mentioned cross Linux from scratch. I thought I'd do the final version using automated Linux from scratch, ALFS. Um, plus also I've already built 12.1 in a set of videos this year when the book was published in March, so it seemed to me to be a bit pointless just to do what would have been a similar video to what I did um, about four months ago. And like I say, it nicely completes the series, incorporating all the projects that are involved or are tied to Linux from scratch. So just go through that again. There's Linux from scratch, which is the parent project. Uh, automated Linux from scratch is what I'm going to be using to build 12.1. Beyond Linux from scratch, BLFS, um, I've used that in building certain packages, for example, links or wget, openssh, etc. And cross Linux from scratch, which is what I use to get from a 32 bit um, operating system, 32 bit version of Linux from scratch into the 64 bit arena with Linux from scratch. Um, so yeah, that's what I'm going to be doing. It does involve a little bit of work up front, but it does save a lot of work in the long term. So it's worth doing from that point of view. And as I say, it just makes something a little bit different um, rather than just going through the motions, as I say, which I've already done earlier on this year. It probably wouldn't be much different, the video, to the original 12.1 video I did four months ago. Um, I'm going to be sticking with the um, E7500 Core 2 Duo I've used for the last two videos. Uh, it's really unfortunate. I'd like to have put this on or well, done these videos on fast machines, but um, as before with the 8.2 video, just not available. Um, so I'll be sticking with Core 2 Duo. It's still reasonably good in terms of compilation speeds. Um, most packages still compile you know, in reasonable time within a few minutes, the smaller ones. It's just the larger one, especially GCC. Um, the testing takes several hours still in the final system phase. And again, that's the only testing I want to do is just the tool chain testing. So what we've got to do first of all is to get our basic Linux from scratch 8.2 into a situation where we can actually run ALFS. Uh, by default, it won't run. There's um, several requirements that need to be fulfilled. Uh, okay, so this is probably me testing the this, what you're about to see. So I need to get rid of that. imagine it's going to be that last one. This looks like it's all encrypted on this one, which is quite good. Let's try that again. Oh, it does actually give me a command there. Uh, I have noticed that the modern ones give you a command to remove them. 
Perhaps I should have done that, never mind. Right, okay, that works anyway. What was that last one? So here I'm into the machine as it was completed in the last video. Um, you can see the host name is LFS 8.2, it's the 4.15.3 kernel. Um, there's the LFS release to confirm that it's 8.2. And I think I can do CPU ID now. No, it's still not available. So, cat CPU info proc. So, just confirm that I'm on this E7500 CPU and it's got two cores. As you can see, there's processor one and processor zero. So, it's not the fastest, it hasn't got uh, the best capability in terms of parallel processing, but as I say, it's reasonable, it's certainly no slouch. Um, it's just the bigger packages that have um, uh, cause it to struggle a little bit. So before I go any further, I'm going to modify, because I'm going to do a bit of hacking around at the command prompt, I'm going to modify the bash profile. Uh, yeah, bash profile, I'm going to create it even. And add in the usual set of exports that I do. <coughs> to ensure that um, the environment is set up reasonably well. So first thing I'm going to do is to change the prompt just so I can see the location I'm in, uh, which is critical. So um, that's user at the host name. So the username at the host name and then the working directory, which is the key bit I want. The username and the host name is always useful to have to know that you're in the, as the right user and as the right um, machine. Now I also forgot about this shortcut, the dollar, I saw this the other day, um, and that should automatically switch between uh, a dollar for a normal user and a hash for a super user. Having said that, this is the bash profile for root, so it, <laughs> it doesn't really matter, uh, but it's there anyway. So let's put an export in front of that, make sure it stays. And I'm going to set make flags because we're going to be do some compiling before we run LFS um, because we've got to build these packages that LFS needs. So let's put that in. And finally, I'm going to set up LFS. So let me now source that. So that's changed the prompt. So you can see I'm root at LFS dash eight dot two or eight, yeah, eight underscore two. If I echo make flags, that's minus J two and echo what was the other thing I set? Uh, LFS of course. And that's set as well. So that's all good. So what I'm going to do next is do fdisk on the hard disk that's in this machine. And you can see we're up to SDA 11. So the next one we could do is SDA 12. So let's go into fdisk and create a new partition at the previous location. And I'll create this as 16 gig. We're going to need some extra space for um, ALFS. Uh, last time GCC took um, about three gigabytes of space, so it's a good chance it's going to require even more this time. So 16 gigabytes should be plenty. So let's print it up. So yeah, we're building Linux from scratch 12.1 on, on partition number 12. So I'll write that. Uh, notice now is the first time it's um, FDisk has never said that um, the changes are in memory, but um, the kernel still uses the old table. So that's interesting. I, I would assume, because it's not warning us, that we could carry on. But to be on the safe side, if ever I'm unsure with anything like this, I'll just do it the old way. Unless I 
read something that says, yeah, it's all right to carry on or I've empirically tested it myself and assured myself that it's okay. Uh, I normally just carry on doing things as I know will work. So what I'm going to do now is reboot. Let's come out of that. And just wait for the machine to start back up again. And as before, I'll do everything remotely. And then on the final videos, I'll just do the um, new boot and do some testing and quick run around everything to make sure everything's fine. Okay, so the kernel's booting. And we should have the server now. Yeah, there it is. Uh, Oh, so if I do f this minus L, there's our partition. So next thing I'm going to do is to format the partition. And we've now got ext4, so I'm going to use that. Uh, let me copy and paste this. So I'm going to create an ext4 partition on dev sta12, which is the partition just created. And that's done. Um, now let's create somewhere to mount that. So let's make the LFS and mount dev sta12 at LFS. So there you can see we've got about 15 gigabytes available. And there is our new file system with the one lost and found directory. So because we've got to do some preparation, I'm going to create a directory called prep and do everything inside that. Go to the local server I've got to download everything I need. So pipo 200. Okay, so there's all the stuff that I need to grab hold of. I'll just go down one at a time and download these. So this is everything I need for the ALFS. Everything for BLFS. Uh, that's the book. I don't need that. I'll need the config. Um, you'll see why. The actual LFS packages. Again, I've not compressed these tar balls because they don't really compress that much. It's just a bit pointless, really. Um, a lot of the packages, a lot of the archives are compressed with XZ, and because that's so uh, well compressed, that data, it's pointless recompressing again. Whereas, certainly with GZIP and a little bit with BZIP2, um, you could get a little bit more compression out of them. So that's the t LFS packages, and finally MD5 sums, and probably don't need this, but I'll download it anyway. <clears throat> so that should be that. Um, so let's extract those tar files so they're ready to use. So start with LFS. BLFS and the LFS packages. Okay. So what I'm going to do now is start going through the um, Linux and Scratch 12.1 book. Um, 
it's probably best to start here preparing the host system and the first thing we need to do is to run the script to get the versions now um, if you've seen the 12.1 video you'll know that the script's been enhanced now that it actually reports what's missing and what isn't missing and what doesn't match and so on so we don't have to spend uh, a lot of time eyeballing these versions and it's quite easy to misread the version sometimes um, for example if you saw find utils 4.2 and find utils 4.20 it's sometimes your brain works thinking oh it's 4.2.0 and it's not it's dot 20 so 4.20 is higher than 4.2 so there's little things like that that can mess with your mind sometimes so this is really useful that they now um, have modified let's say the script to um, give a confirmation of what's good and what's bad. So you can see straight away that the first thing um, that's not good is the kernel is too out of date. 4.19 or later is required. And in the book somewhere it does mention, in fact it's here, um, that officially 4.19 is the oldest supported kern, uh, kernel version. Um, so it probably would work with 4.15 but it's not guaranteed. So let's not take any risks let's just go with what the advice is and recompile the kernel uh, to 4.19 or later and then build upon that so with that in mind I'm going to go to the LFS package it or no I'll stay here actually I'll extract from the LFS packages directory I've just extracted the Linux kernel so you can see the conversion of the kernel that is associated with Linux from scratch 12.1 is Linux 6.7.4. Um, so it didn't say anything about not using a newer one. Um, in fact, it didn't say any upper limit at all. It just says it's got to be greater than that minimum limit. So let's go into that and start building it cleaning the directory um, what I'm going to do here normally I do is a cat proc uh, config dot gz and create the or expand the config that I've got built into the kernel um, but rather than that rather than go through all the options in the kernel enabling things I might need uh, or checking things I'm just going to use one I've made earlier in fact it's the final um, config I did for the final system so I'm hoping it's not going to affect anything too much at this stage uh, in theory the only difference would be the compiler that's going to compile the kernel um, obviously at the moment we've got GCC version 7.3 and we're going to be going to GCC version 13 dot something so uh, probably 13.2 13.1 maybe um, so that, that in theory should be the only difference so I'll copy that config file, call it its correct name so it gets recognized. And I'll do make old config. Just ensure that that is a valid config file. And yeah, it doesn't, oh, there's unexpected data, which always happens when I download off that server. I think it's some setting. I looked into it and it seems to be fine when I'm using a browser. Um, so it seems to be some setting with links that needs to be altered that it adds in the headers. So let's get rid of that. I'll do that with the other ones because they'll be the same. W get this. Like I said, I don't think I need this. I can't think why I would. I've already downloaded them in the tarball. So. And I guess I should have done an MD5 sum check. I'll run that now quickly actually, just to be sure. Yeah, everything's all fine. So 
So let's go back to the Linux directory and I'll copy that config file again. Now it has got those headers removed and rerun make old config. Okay, that's better. Now I'll just quickly run menu config just to confirm that it is the config that I want to use. So under general setup, you can see I've got this suffix um, that I've put in that gets appended. Um, uh, yeah, now one thing that might be a problem, I think I've got some notes about this. Yeah, this, um, it might be a bug that needs to be fixed in the JHALFS script. Um, because when the checks are being run for uh, during JHALFS, it seems that this name that I've given it confuses it and it thinks the E7500, presumably with this underscore, uh, is a, an exponent. So it takes the version at the end of the kernel, which is, uh, I can't remember what it was now, say it's 12. Uh, this underscore gets put next to that 12. So the script reads the release, the revision version, a part of the kernel. So let's, let's just have a look and see if we can explain this. Uh, Yeah, so for example, this bit here, it takes that, the JHALFS script takes that and reads it, or takes all of that actually, I believe, and reads that as three exponents 7500. So basically three to the power of 7500 times 10 to the power of 7500. Um, and it comes up saying, you know, the number's out of range, some some such error like that. Um and I've had to tweak the script to get around that. So there could be a bug where um, it's obviously some function in bash that's being utilized and bash interprets uh, that as a huge, huge number. So that's something to bear in mind. I'm not gonna, shall I change this? Perhaps I should really. Um, let me just see what I did change it to. Right, yes, yes, changing that underscore to hyphen seemed to fix it. So I'll change that. Actually, no, I'll leave it in there to demonstrate it, demonstrate the fault, because um, I've got a fix for it. Um, but it'll demonstrate the fault, and uh, if anything, anybody from the Linux or Scratch team is watching, then perhaps that's something that could be fixed on the um, JHALFS script. So yeah, it's the, it's the right kernel anyway, so I'll just quit that. I don't need to do anything else with it. Um, so I'm gonna build it now and wait for it to complete. It's approximately 10 minutes.
Okay, so 12 and a half minutes for that, and we've built the kernel. So what I'm going to do now is to mount the boot partition and copy the kernel to the boot and I'll call it VM Linux dash six dot seven dot four dash LFS eight dot two okay and same with the system dot map to boot system dot map and the config again same uh, that's just so we know that when we build the real one for Linux and scratch 12 this will be the one that was built for 8.2 even though as I say functionally they're going to be the same they may differ in the fact that the kernel has been compiled with different compilers this one's been compiled with 7.3 I think it was and the new one will obviously be compiled with um, GCC 13 right so next we need to add an entry into the grub menu.list file so let's copy that block and paste it in so this is going to be um, LFS 8.2 um, dash v 6.7.4 So I'll just change that, 6.7.4, LFS 8.2, and we're sticking on SDA 11. We still want to be booting LFS 8.2, it's just the kernel we're changing at the moment. So let's now save that, I'll amount boot, and reboot to activate that kernel. Okay, so the machine is just cycling and just got the BIOS messages coming up at the moment. Right, so I've got the grub menu up with the new menu option, press enter and it's booting the new kernel. Okay, so let's now go back in. Let's do you name minus a and you can see we've got 6.7.4 and that suffix again which is so I think is going to cause some problems with uh, JHALFS and just to confirm we are still on LFS 8.2 just the kernel that's changed so now let's remount dev SDA 12 at LFS, change into LFS, change into the prep directory and we'll rerun the version check script and it should, yes it does report, everything's fine. So we're now in a position where we meet all the requirements to build Linux from scratch 12. So what we've got to do now is to build the um, packages that are required to allow JHALFS to operate correctly. So that entails going to Beyond Linux and Scratch, but for version 8.2 because we're still running at uh, version 8.2. And um, basically what we need here is we need... For some reason, I don't understand. I don't know if it's me. I, I've done something wrong, but 
even though you tell it that the book's offline, um, it still seems to want to use Git um, to go somewhere. So it seems to work all right if you've got the packages already downloaded. It doesn't go off and try and fetch them. Um, but even though I've downloaded the book, uh, the XML, and put it in the correct place, it still seems to want, and found it, it still seems to want to use Git. So um do have to install Git. Um, also need to install sudo because um, it's just the way the JFS works. Um, it operates solely as a normal user, but obviously it needs to elevate to uh, root user to do certain things. So it does that by using sudo. So um, that's a requirement. And then there's several, I think it's about three different um, XML related technology packages that required um, and some of their dependencies. So we'll start off with the first one, which is libxml2. Uh, I'm going to do these in order because some do actually have dependencies on other packages that we're installing. So uh, I'll just know the right order already. Right, the font's shrunk on that a little bit. Let's make that a bit bigger. Okay, so let's have a look. Yeah, let's go into this BLFS mini kit. That's the one for 8.2. So we need libxml2, 2.2, sorry, 2.9.7. No, it's not this one. What's this one for? Oh, this is the bit after. See, yes, I'm in the wrong one. ALFS want to be in. Right, yes. Yeah, so here's all the patches that I need to build um, all the requirements to run JHL ALFS. So there's the package we need there. So let's extract that. Uh, there's an optional test suite which I've downloaded, but I don't think I bothered with it. So let's start with the patch. And for a file that the module can be built with the Python we've got, and we'll start the build. Okay, I'm not going to bother with the test suite. I'll just install this. And that's done. Tidy that up. So the next one I need to do is SGML common. So we've got this patch first and then auto reconf. Then we build it. And install it. I 
That's that one done. Uh, next we've got unzip. Okay, that's done. Next package is docbook XSL. XSL, that one there. So we've got a patch uh, to download the documentation. It's probably a bit pointless, but it's there anyway. And then we put all these commands in to install the package and run this to install the documentation. Create or append and populate the XML catalog file using the following commands. Let's put all that lot in. Okay, I don't need to do that last bit, so let's get rid of that. And move on to Docbook XML, which is that one. So you can see that we've basically been installing dependencies for this package mostly. Right, this package source is distributed in a zip format and requires unzip. You should create a directory and change to that directory before unzipping the file. So, okay, not XML but MXL. So, unzip doc book XML. And then run these commands. Create update and populate the docbook catalog by running these commands. And the XML catalog catalog file. Okay, as far as updates coming goes. Right, okay, so we need to run this now. Um, it says if you have any of the docbook XML DTTs referenced below already installed in the system, remove these entries from the four command. Well, we shouldn't have because this is a fresh installation, so we can just stick that in. And that should be it. That's that one and libxslt next. So I've got a little change to make and then configure and build. And 
the install. Right, so that's all the XML type stuff done. So the next thing we need to do is to install sudo. Do this when I was testing, but just notice there's a without PAM switch there, so it did seem to work. But I'll add that in because we definitely haven't got PAM. Okay, and build it. And install it. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is just quickly configure it. It's got some information here about that. Um, I'm just going to do vice sudo and change. Uh, which one is it? This here, so any user that's a member of the wheel has got root privileges and they don't need to add uh, into their password. So that's done. Next, I've got a uh, curl which Git needs. Oops. Should I have had it in make CA? I can't remember if I did that or not. Oh, yes, it's already exists. That's right, I did that on 8.2. That's okay. Right, so curl. Uh, okay. So we can just copy and paste this in. In actual fact, when we run um, JFS, JHALFS, there's options for building parts of BLFS, which puts the new system that's been automatically built into a similar situation to what we're doing here. But it's a little bit more thorough. It builds things like ICU, um, which I think is to do with internationalization, um, and certain other packages that I've not installed here, um, libpsl, libtasm, and p11 kit. So. Um, it's a little bit more thorough, but this is enough to get going um, and to get the package working. Right, so let's install all that. And the last package we've got to build is Git. Right, where's that gone to? There it is. So 
So configure and build. There's any other options worth looking at? Just wait a few moments for this to be installed. Right, so that's built. Um, we haven't got ASCII doc or XML TO, so we can't build the um, man pages and other documents. So let's just install that. But we've got some commands here to install pre-rendered pre documents, which I've downloaded. So I'm just put these commands in for documentation and some commands to reorganize those. So that is that. So that's all the package dependencies installed. What I've got to do now is to just tidy that up. Uh, need to add a normal user to be able to run JHALFS. It won't run as root. It specifically warns you about that and it halts if you try to run it as root. Um, now, one thing, the state of things as they stand, um, there's no wheel group. Uh, and I assume that's because, of, of, well, yeah, I'm assuming it's because we haven't created PAM or installed PAM and that would normally create it. I'm not sure, but I, that's my assumption. Um, so what I'm going to do is add it manually with group add, uh, group number 97, I think it was, was the sort of accepted default. So adding a group called wheel as group ID 97. And then I'm going to add a user that I can use to run JHALFS. So minus M to create a home directory, minus G to say I want to use wheel as an additional group. That's in addition to the default. Um, group which again by default is uh, the same name as the username and I call it kernel text so we should have a home directory yep it's just been created and I also need to set the password for that user so I can log into it Okay, so I should be able to, um, let's try becoming the kernel text user. So yeah, that's worked. And you can see there, it's telling me that I'm part of the wheel group. So what I'm gonna do now is to log out and, oops, 
I'm going to log back in again. Um, e seven five double O. And yes, I've logged in. Yeah, you can see I'm kind of text there. I'm going to do sudo um, su minus become root immediately. And you can see it's allowed me to come root using sudo. Um, and it's not asked me for the password either. So let's prove that that's all working.